Batman the Chalice. When a mysterious denizen of Gotham City gives Thomas Wayne's son an old box, it sets in motion a series of events that shake Batman's world. Suddenly, dark villains including the demon's head Ross al Ghul, the Penguin, and Catwoman, as well as dozens of mercenaries are battling to possess the simple drinking bowl now in Batman's hands. As the battles build to a savage crescendo, deadly duels between combatants are played out. Many questions demand to be answered. Could this really be the holy grail of legend? Can even its apparently miraculous abilities keep the Dark Knight detective alive long enough to find out? And what does one do with it if it is the real thing? Is it readworthy? Let's find out. The story begins with a muted color palette and heavy black ink in the shape of a knight questing for the, you guessed it, holy grail. It's all very dramatic in tone in the beginning. Quote, in a hail of steel and iron, he made the safety of the heart of his enemy's dark fortress, for there lay the object of his quest hidden in the heart of the keep of the dark ones. End quote. After hacking through some red shirts, Bruce, went, I mean, the knight, is suddenly homeless and inside the fortress. We get our first glimpse of his nightly t shirt hoodie, which of course has a familiar symbol on its front. It's basically an Easter egg. He makes a beeline for the Cup of Christ, which he knew would guarantee him one golden ticket into the pearly gates. He holds it up to his face, witnessing the glory of 4K Ultra HD held within. He senses a dagger-wielding naughty nun behind him, but he rolls a natural 20 on initiative and sticks her with the pointy end of his sword. Here it states in the panel, quote, Many were those who coveted its power, and all were not motivated by God's love. End quote. Ah yes, God's love urging humans to murder each other since time immemorial. There's a preponderance of black ink throughout this graphic novel, which is not necessarily a bad thing, just an observation. Let's move on to Batman proper. We first see him sloppily ambush Two-Face and his men on a rooftop at night. Or day. Who knows? The sky coloring is unnatural, to say the least. Probably pollution. It's not clear as to why they're on a rooftop, either. After dropping a billboard on Two-Face, Batman returns to the Batcave with a gunshot wound in his thigh. He tells Alfred that he, quote, recaptured Two-Face with no loss of life, end quote. I guess those two goons that Two-Face shot to pieces were nobodies. Alfred tends to his wound, but states it's beyond his apparently rudimentary medical skills to safely remove the bullet so close to the femoral artery. I thought Alfred was more skilled than that? Batman complains, quote, if only I could do more, end quote, then passes out. The next day, and we know this because it says so, a mysterious handmade package arrives addressed to Thomas Wayne, his father. I guess the sender doesn't read the newspaper or watch TV since Thomas is dead. To the Batcave! Batman detects that it's from the early Middle Ages. He's an expert detector, you see. And he finds a list of names they're in. And what do you know? The name in the book has an address listed conveniently in Gotham City. By the way, I find it comical that Bruce put on his bat suit just to open the package. Like, what? Meanwhile, we jump to Ross al Ghul, who is sword fighting three shirtless, turban wearing men in what appears to be a live volcano. I guess he fights slaves or captives in Mortal Kombat to stay sharp? An old man named Sharam appears after he's cut them to pieces and reveals that the Gradale has resurfaced. We bounce back to Bruce, who's just arrived at the address from the book. Lord Wensleygate's assistant says that they had been expecting someone younger, meaning his father, which again is silly since a cursory search would reveal that Thomas is not only not young, but dead. Wensleygate states, quote, I lose track of such things, end quote. It feels like lazy reasoning in the writing. Wensleygate is super old, kept alive by numerous medical devices to prolong his life. He introduces himself as Peter DeWettering and tells Batman that he knew his grandfather, Solomon. The devices remind me of that scene in Captain America, The Winter Soldier, when Cap and Nat are in the old shield bunker, and it's revealed that Dr. Arnim Zola lives on by way of a bunch of tape drives. Winsleygate explains that the blood duty falls to Bruce, as the Wayne family are descendants of the medieval knight Gawain, a bastardized version of Gawain, perhaps, whose line has, quote, borne this responsibility many times, end quote. The assistant hands the artifact to Bruce, and Lord Winsleygate immediately croaks. After Bruce leaves, Winsleygate's assistant realizes that someone else has come for the grail. She wonders if the Lord had, quote, an inkling of my other dimension, end quote, but is soon gunned down. Curious, but it hints at nothing. Back in the Batcave and in costume again, Batman opens the chest. 
Inside, they find a small, unremarkable drinking bowl. Batman humbly brags that he's a bit of a grail scholar, then drops some historical knowledge on Alfred's shiny dome. Alfred asks what Bruce intends to do. Batman, the noble hero, says he will stick to his role as protector and assumes some familiar faces will come round for it. I wish this foreshadowing implied kick-ass confrontations between Bats and his rogues gallery, but no, not really. The Merovingian thugs who broke into Lord Winsigate's manor report to Mr. Cheval that the Grail left in a silver Bugatti, but the art is so dark in the panels that it looks black. They set the manor ablaze from which Ubu, Ross's man, emerges and beheads them both. He kind of looks like Casey Jones with a sword. After analysis, Bruce thinks the Grail could be a fake, so he decides to test this by pouring water from the cup over his wounded leg. That's right, Batman, genius detective, eek human athlete, and martial artist, has been walking around with a bullet in his thigh, near the femoral artery, no less, for at least a day or two. Can't tell me this guy doesn't know a single doctor that would patch him up? A guy that rich and well-connected? Bruce is miraculously healed, of course, and even dissolves a bullet, just like in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Elsewhere, Ross Al Ghul explains to old man Sharam that he's already failed to capture the Grail in Cathay, Krakow, and Spain, so he's a tad obsessed with it. Tali Al Ghul drops by, wondering about Ubu, so Ross says he went on an errand to the New World. While hanging out on a rooftop doing Batman things, Batman is visited by Azrael. Azrael feels that Batman will be outmatched by those who seek the Holy Grail. Batman's ego tells him to go away. This was a missed opportunity by Dixon, have Batman enlist Azrael's help as an unlikely ally, as he's a religious zealot of the Order of St. Dumas, but uh, I digress. At Gotham PD, derpy Sergeant Bullock is confused as to why he's received a case file. This bit is practically meaningless to the story, as he and Montoya contribute virtually nothing. Elsewhere in Gotham, the Merovingian Mr. Cheval arrives to lead the retrieval of the Grail personally, and he looks like he's about to cry in the last panel. Seriously, some of the faces in this book are really quite something. Batman has Oracle, a.k.a. Barbara Gordon, analyze the Grail data and suggests that the object's healing powers could be used to heal her, to allow her to walk again. She states she doesn't believe in miracles or have faith. To my knowledge, Batman isn't exactly devout. This is a ridiculous response. E even if she's atheist, when presented with the possibility to walk again, Batman is not the type to joke about such things, so why not give it a shot? There's no risk in drinking from a stone bowl. Meanwhile, Ra's al Ghul slaps around Ubu for missing the grail at the estate. Ubu mentions the Merovingians and Bruce Wayne, but Ross already knows this. He orders a two-pronged attack, one on Bruce Wayne and one on Batman, which Talia overhears. The worst-dressed Catwoman I've ever seen drops in on the Penguin at Iceberg Lounge, which has the architectural appeal of a boiler unit. She's holding a fish like she's a model showcasing a new product. Catwoman tells Penguin that she wants the job for the artifact. He insists only the artifact is to be stolen and nothing else while grimacing like he's trying to fart. She acquiesces in disappointment and refers to the artifact as a dingus. Batman drops in on Commissioner Gordon, but this also adds nothing to the overall story. Just idle conversations since Batman leaves abruptly. The cops are useless throughout. Batman spots one of the Manklin gang and mentions they've been taking down big scores, but that's it. There's nothing in the story about them. Seems pointless, just a plot device to keep the story padded and plodding along. Ross's men observe his movements. Catwoman breaks into Wayne Manor and snoops around, exclaiming aloud at all of the knickknacks. She says she's, quote, scanned the whole place for electronics, end quote. No, not tell people. Then she just so happens to dump out a flower vase near a grandfather clock and the water seeps towards it. However, she is caught by Alfred, who wields a shotgun aimed at her back. Some professional burglar. Batman drops in on Mooch in the gang at a boathouse and engages him quickly, but some of Ross al Ghul's men kill all of the Manklin goons. Why not kill Batman too, then collect the grail from his mansion, since Ross knew he had it in his possession regardless of persona? Back at Wayne Manor, the Merovingians break in, so Alfred and Catwoman decide to form a temporary action duo. The first panel of the intruders shows they have a clear advantage in numbers and weaponry and could have killed Alfred and Catwoman from a distance, but they have plot armor. In the next several pages, character's perspective is all over the place, so I'll just shortly summarize what happens for the sake of time. Ross al Ghul's men deliberately avoid shooting at Batman and instead allow him to beat the snot out of them as they chase him outside. He re reaffirms to himself his vow to protect the cup, bull, whatever. Alfred and Catwoman fight through the crowd of men unscathed, but Cheval manages to restrain Catwoman instead of, you know, killing her. 
Forced out into the harbor, Batman makes his stand atop a pole and fights off Ross's minions. Cheval demands the cup after Alfred tells him that she doesn't know where it is. Previously, there were two guys behind Cheval, but they disappeared. Ubu, looking like Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th popping out of the water, snaps the pole and drags Batman underwater. Catwoman breaks free and KOs Cheval. Alfred asks why she didn't do that sooner, and she admits that she was hoping Alfred would unwittingly tell her where the dingus is to appease Cheval. Sirens are heard in the distance, so Alfred allows her to scamper off. I guess they fought underwater off the page since Batman drags Ubu ashore and is confronted by Ross. Ross starts to monologue about his plan, so Batman deduces that the Grail is for Talia as they begin to fight. Ross wants Talia to join him in immortality. Ross states, quote, After all of our encounters, your reasoning skills still surprise me, detective. End quote. I thought that was, like, totally obvious. He laments the idea of having to watch her grow old and die. Batman breaks Ross's finest Damascus blade by scissoring it between two batarangs, which is completely ridiculous. I mean, such a feat would require immense strength and pressure to pull off, but this is par for the course regarding this book. Pissed, Ross thrusts the broken blade in Batman's ribs. Talia gets their attention by shooting around them instead of saying hello or something, and admits she knows about her father's plans. She'd willingly die for her father, but she will not become immortal for him. The attraction of eternal life has waned being in her father's company and does not have the appeal that it might for others. She says, quote, Let me live each day as a precious one, not dread each morning as an endless progression. You go, girl. Ross reluctantly agrees with Talia. Before departing, he warns Batman that others, worse than he, will seek it out while Batman bleeds out on the beach. Don't worry, he's fine. Across the sound, Montoya and Bullock find the dead Manklin gang members and the bodies of Ross Ogle's unconscious men. Recognizing their tattoos, Bullock realizes that what happened there is beyond the Manklin gang. Still clueless. Back in the Batcave, Batman refuses to have his rather serious stab wound treated by Alfred as there's, quote, no time, end quote. Why not use the grail again and pour it over the wound? He knows how it works. This drives me crazy. He's dying, but tells Alfred that he has to pass it off ASAP. So why not let Alfred drive him if he refuses to use the grail? Alfred can clean up the mess from the invasion later. If I had any hair, I'd probably be pulling on it right now. All right, so let's wrap this up. In a diner outside the city limits that doesn't appear to have electricity, Batman brings the artifact to the booth where a bespectacled man is waiting. Bruce admits that his pride convinced him that he could protect the Holy Grail, but he failed, so that's why he's handing it over. Clark Kent, aka Superman, accepts the artifact and promises that he knows, quote, just the place, end quote. Probably the Fortress of Solitude in No Man's Land, Clark zips away, and Bruce is left with a tab. All right, so in conclusion, here are my thoughts on this graphic novel. Overall, I'd say this is the most neutral I've felt um, reading a graphic novel, and that's not a good thing. This is the first uh, Batman graphic novel that didn't do anything for me, nothing at all. It's disappointing, really. All of the characters seem like shallow versions of themselves, and that's due to the length of the story. They didn't have enough time to be developed. With such an interesting premise, much more could have been done. More of the characters, their relationships and motivations and subplots could have made this an epic Batman story like The Long Halloween or Year One. So rating this on the readometer, it lands at a week two out of five. The story isn't compelling. The characters are quite shallow in their motivations and depth, and the art is dark, unusual, and somewhat perplexing at times. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe down below. It really helps us spread the word. Peace.